Hey guys, welcome back to The Base Brief. This week we're talking about the Supreme Court hearing a hugely controversial case, Trump goes wild on Truth Social, Kanye spiral continues, and more. Let's jump in. All right, happy Tuesday, Brad. Hey. How's your week going? Uh, I'm still really asleep as we record this this morning, so sorry if I look or sound like that. That's because I am. I had a late night last night. I had a soccer game at 9.15 is when it started. So oh my gosh. Uh, then, you know, you, I get home at like 10.30 and I have all this energy, uh, kind of, you know how you get like a runner's high or whatever, so I didn't fall asleep till after midnight. But it was like my, we lost and I, it was the worst I've played in a very long time. So that just put me in a sour mood and I don't think I'll be out of it until tonight where I have another game. Hopefully I'll do better. Hopefully you can jump out of it. Um, how is it running around in Michigan this time of year? Is it getting cold yet? Are you freezing? Well, it's pretty cold, but I just don't go outside really. Okay. I mean, I just go from my car house to my car to my, to the building, then back to the car. Oh, you play inside soccer? Oh, yes, it's indoor, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's nice. I mean, I, I play outdoor they... in, in the warm seasons, but... Yeah, I didn't really think about them making adaptions like that, or adaptations like that in Michigan, but that tracks. Um, well, I'm getting into the holiday spirit. I have always, in years past, been what my family refers to as a bit of a Grinch. Like, I never decorate, I never put up trees, I just, like, I don't, I don't know, I do think a oh, lot of Oh, we got a decor. tree and we decorated. It's our first well, season with a house, say, so... Yeah, I'm doing it this year. I went and spent like $300 at Home Goods. I bought a bunch of decor. I'm laughing though because it's like a very Swedish style decor Christmas decoration, like wood and like neutrals. It's like none of the like over the top, like green, like red tacky kind of stuff. But I got a tree and I'm actually having a holiday party this Saturday. So I'm really getting into the spirit and kind of looking forward to all the season's festivities. Look at me. That's great. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the day's news deck. We've got a big story at the top of the hour, and I'm going to let you kind of give the deep dive. We've got a case known as 303 Creative that is before the Supreme Court right now, and it has major religious liberty, major free speech implications, and I think it's a fascinating kind of showdown. So let's jump into it. Yeah, so folks probably remember the Masterpiece Cake Shop case from a few years ago, the Christian baker who didn't want to bake a, a cake, a custom cake for a gay wedding. That case ended up getting kind of decided on very narrow grounds, and they didn't establish a sweeping precedent or anything. So this is essentially that case 2.0. 303 Creative, the Supreme Court uh, heard the oral argument on Monday, and we're going to actually play some clips of the justices that I thought were very interesting. A lot, of, a lot of folks probably haven't heard what the justices sound like, and I found it cool, so I clipped a few uh, little bits from the oral argument. Um, but the basic facts are essentially that there is this website designer in Colorado, the same state where the, the cake bakery case happened, and she currently has a website design business and she wants to expand into weddings, but she doesn't want to do gay weddings because she has traditional beliefs about marriage. Uh, and to custom design a wedding website includes writing words and copy that celebrate the union. So this is very clearly a speech case. There was some dispute. Does baking a cake really count as speech? In this one, they agree it's speech. And then the question is, what comes first? The First Amendment or anti-discrimination law in Colorado? Does the First Amendment give you a right to not create speech that you disagree with? Or is it really just... This is just commercial conduct that's being regulated, not really speech under the First Amendment, and civil rights law trumps it. That's the argument that we're having here. Um, I don't know. What, what was your kind of initial thoughts on the case? Well, so I want to clarify a few things. So I think this can get very confusing very quickly, and I've done my own digging on this a bit. So the reason these cases keep coming out of Colorado is Colorado passed an additional layer at the state level to civil rights law a couple of years ago that does the language it's it's not a good it's not a good written piece of law right it's it's very murky it's not very clear like what comes first because um, religion can also be a protected class and so there's this sort of innate dispute and so you keep seeing these pro bono cases come up like this is not you know just a 
organic case out of nowhere. Like, there were clearly groups with interest on the religious liberty side who were looking for good challenges to this law to try to get the right ruling. And the Cake Baker case failed to do that, right? They He got kind of a narrow ruling that just applied to him. But the ruling at that level at the Supreme Court did not take out this Colorado law. So now you see this new challenge coming up. So I was curious to see what angle they were going to take. And just to reiterate, but I want to make this very clear, this woman is not saying that she would not serve gay customers. She's not saying, you know, she wants to put up a no LGBTQ sign in her window. She says she would happily serve gay people, but she doesn't want to do gay weddings specifically. And I think that is where you get into the speech component. If you're being compelled to say speech or to not say speech by the government that you disagree with, I think based on any grounds, but certainly based on religious grounds, there is a violation of free speech there. And I think that the Supreme Court does have to ultimately come in and say, you know, which who stands there, who wins that argument. And I think the best way to get to a harmonious civil society would be to uphold free speech. Um, I don't think you should be allowed to ban service to certain classes of people. I think that, you know, when it gets to that level, um, we need to go on the other direction. But these are these are really murky, nuanced waters, and we have to tread very carefully. Yeah. I think, you know, I wish there was no case for government to get involved at all because ultimately somebody does lose here. But I think um, th- we have to find a balance, and so it is the right place for the Supreme Court to step in and figure this out. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned it's a free speech case. It is not a religious liberty case, not really, um, because it doesn't have to be religious grounds. She could be refusing on non-religious grounds, and it would be the same case. Uh, The Supreme Court has already said a long time ago that you can't just cite religious freedom and get out of civil rights law, right? Like, you can't just say, well, my my restaurant, it's my religious belief, we don't serve blacks here. Like, that's not going to cut it. It doesn't work. Um... But in this case, it's because it's an act of speech. It's not just denying general services. No one, either party, is arguing that, uh, you know, a hamburger joint could put up a sign that says no gays allowed because there's no, or that a housing complex that's bound by anti-discrimination law could say we won't rent apartments to gay people because those aren't speech acts. This, Mm -hmm. this, the real debate is this is a speech act on those kinds of things. Where do we draw the line? And with that in mind, one of the debates is whose speech is it? Because some of the liberal judges, like Sonia Sotomayor, were trying to argue, well, it's not really your speech. It's really the customer's speech, and you're just facilitating it. But I actually thought the Alliance Defending Freedom Attorney uh, in the oral argument, and I'm not a huge fan of ADF, but I thought she did a good job um, explaining why that doesn't make sense. Uh, Take a listen to this one, guys. Whose speech the pol- is the person viewing it going to think is talking? The Pulitzer you- Prize doesn't go to the customer or to the subject. It goes to the photographer. And there's a reason for that. That reason is because you are requiring that artist to speak a message. It is their work. It might also be the customer's, and the customer can use that. But the First Amendment is broad enough to cover the lesbian website designer and the Catholic calligrapher. The line is that no one on any side of any debate has to be compelled to express a message that violates their core convictions because, as this court found, it's demeaning to them. Yeah, so I actually thought the lawyer did a pretty good response there explaining why facilitating the speech does make it the owner's speech too. Um, and so I'm, I definitely on this part of the issue, I think it's pretty clear that it would be the website designer's speech. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to point out, I love that you found this audio. I don't think that either of us knew that you could actually hear audio transcripts. I knew they were really written transcripts, but this is cool getting to actually go in and hear the different uh, people speaking and hear like how compelling her voice sounds. And I think she did a good job too. I think she made a good distinction. And in listening to that, I'm reminded of another piece I read about this case, which is that it's going to have severe implications on a few other cases that you and I have been tracking pretty carefully and reporting on at Base Politics, which are the content moderation cases out of both Texas and Florida right now. Uh, where Republicans in the state legislature tried to come in and basically dictate to social media companies how they can moderate their content. And the argument that she's making um, over whose speech it is and whether or not somebody should be forced and compelled to host it or write it it's going to actually probably impact both of those cases as well. So I, you know, I'm, I'm really strongly on the side of free speech in this case. And I think she did a good job of sort of 
um, broadening the horizon in that response and and pointing out this is this is bigger than just an LGBTQ issue for sure. Yeah, for sure. And also, uh, I will just say this: there was a female attorney for the uh, Lori Smith representing her from the Alliance Defending Freedom. Then there were two male attorneys defending the government's position in this case, which is you know he should ha- she should have to design the website. And I don't know whether it's because of the male female dynamic or I don't know if it's because they agreed with the male lawyers and disagreed with the female lawyers, but the liberal female justices interrupted the attorney for ADF every single time she spoke. She got like two words out and then the liberal justices would interrupt her. Now they are women, so I'm not saying that they're doing it for being sexist, but the the other the male justices the, the conservative male justices were very deferential to letting the other women speak it was just a very interesting gender dynamic um and also kind of i don't know if that's normal to interrupt so much i know the point is for the justices to do q and a but she could barely get a word in edgewise and i find myself feeling bad for her at some point <laughs> the the adf attorney that's really interesting. And as a woman, I, you and I have talked about this a lot. You've, you've been in meetings with me and even pointed out like certain people will talk over me and not talk over you. And like I've seen it in interviews that we've done with hosts where I sometimes feel like some hosts talk over me more than they do men. It, it's a very frustrating feeling as a woman. And I, I don't think that it's like consciously done, but it happens a lot. And when it happens to you, it's really hard to like to, I don't know, I'm a pretty assertive person, but I often find it hard to, like, speak up in a way that doesn't sound super whiny and get, like, Kamala Harris, like, I'm speaking kind of territory. So I I kind of do feel bad for her in that instance, and I'm actually not surprised that the liberal justices would do it more to the person they disagree with, because I think um, there is a real lack of, like, respect or open-mindedness oftentimes when to just even listening to or entertaining the arguments on the other side of the aisle that I've, I've found in left-wing circles where like they just want to shut it down it's like no this is the narrative this is the way this is it and they don't really want to listen I think I don't know the conservative justices from what I've heard and I haven't like I said we just found this new um, audio transcript thing but from former clips that I've heard the the male justices tend to be very respectful and and deferential and like even keeled most of the time when I've heard them yeah I I that's this is the first one I've listened to uh, but that's the impression that I got um I will say that I, and this is kind of in line with what you were just saying about not being very charitable, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, I think she realizes that most people would think, oh, this website designer should not have to do this. So she and the other liberal judges kept pivoting to compare it to interracial marriage or discriminating against disabled people, um, which I think is not a super fair comparison and is not really apples to apples. Um, but let's take a listen to what she had to say. To ensure so that in- what's the limiting line of yours, of yours? Um, Justice Kagan asked you about another website designer, but how about people who don't believe in interracial marriage, or about people who don't believe that disabled people should get married? What's where's the line? I choose to serve whom I want if I disagree with their personal characteristics like race or disability? So I thought this was a little bit of a straw man for a couple reasons. One, I'm not aware that there actually are people out there who don't want disabled people to get married, but I get that that doesn't matter for the purposes of a hypothetical in this kind of legal argument. But she pivoted to, so you can just deny services based on a characteristic of somebody you don't like. But once again, that's not what we're talking about in this case. Because she, the websites that she designs, she'll design for anybody. If a gay wedding planner came in and was planning a heterosexual wedding, she would design the website. If a straight wedding planner planner came in and asked for a homosexual wedding website, she would not design the website. It's about the what, not the who. And I felt like she is again acting like she's asking for a, a permission slip to just cite religious liberty and discriminate. And the hard answer to this question, and the, the attorney goes on to talk about like legal exceptions and doctrines, but the hard answer is yes. It includes even vile things. So you can't just say, oh, my religious liberty, I won't serve black people at my restaurant. But if you run a a speech-based business, 
like say that you uh, print t-shirts and somebody wants you to print on a t-shirt, interracial marriage is a good thing. You should have the First Amendment right to deny that service as a racist. Now, you, that makes you a bad person. That makes you unhinged, that you're wrong, but you still have free speech rights. And so for me, the hard answer to Sonia Sotomayor's say so too with somebody who doesn't want to support disabled people. I think that's messed up. I think that's wrong. But that's part of freedom is people having free speech, even for very offensive things that people agree are bad. And that's what she's not getting. She's like, well, what about these bad things? They, would these exist? And it's like, yes, they would. And that's the price of a free society is my honest answer to her. Yeah. So I this actually gets to the heart of an issue within libertarianism that I've struggled with throughout my political tenure, which gets into like freedom of association and where the line is. Because I think if you go hardline libertarian, you would say carte blanche. The government should never intervene. There should always be pure free speech, pure freedom of association. And that means that, yes, you'll have some seedy, disgusting people deny services to people, um, refuse to like serve them. And the way to handle that is through the free market, to not support those people, to out them, to basically use market incentives to move away from them. And I think that as a whole, the free market is strong enough to do that over time, right? It's not a very expedient answer. I think that um, had you not had the Civil Rights Act in 1964, I think it would have taken a lot more time, probably a couple more decades, honestly, for Jim Crow to fully go away. Um, and I think that I have been dissuaded of the notion that the government should never intervene in those issues over time. Um, because I think that you can have instances where people literally cannot get services and that's not acceptable to wait decades for people to be able to get basic services to go into a restaurant or to go, you know, get their kid into school, etc. Um, but it's, it still remains to be a very murky line to me. And so when the government does start getting involved and, and dictating, you know, when you can deny service, when you can't, I'm a little swayed by Sotomayor's comments, right? If we're going to say that, um, that you can have an exception, uh, if you, you know, this, this, person who designs weddings doesn't have to to design them for gay marriages because that you know that conflicts with their views well then i think it is a real possibility you might have a i mean i think it's be rare but you might have somebody who is a racist who would deny people an interracial marriage website as well and i, I agree with you like that is kind of the price of a free society and i'd rather just see those people go out of business and like move on versus have a hardline government rule that implicates people and forces speech in ways that get far you know far away from these like really icky kind of matters but it, it, it's murky to me and i think uh, i'm, I'm kind of interested in how they how the attorneys representing the client respond to that and if they make a compelling argument that would really like legally sort of define that they I think try to have the best of both worlds they try to say no that wouldn't be allowed because of these legal doctrines, but also if it did happen, it would be allowed. <laughs> so, and that happens a lot in legal arguments where they try to argue for both constituencies. Yeah. I think Sonia Sotomayor is not wrong. There might be some rare cases where this would happen, but she's saying, so therefore it shouldn't be allowed. And I'm saying, and yes, and those cases would probably have to be allowed too under this framework. But I yeah. do think, I agree with you, the line is murky. And I also don't believe, I'm not against all anti-discrimination laws. I think we can divide it up like this. A service or product that is offered onto the free market should be offered to all. If I'm selling cookies at my bakery or birthday cakes, I can't say, no, I won't sell them to you. You're the wrong characteristic. But for specific things that involve speech and customization, I think you should have the right to say no to specific projects or things that aren't allowed or that aren't uh, in line with your values. And the reason I think that is one, I think that's what the First Amendment requires. Uh, but two, I want that right for myself. Because imagine this, flip it on its head. Say that I'm a website designer as a gay person who believes in gay marriage. And somebody wants me to design a website uh, full of Christian Bible verses and anti-gay Bible verses about how uh, repent, see the light, man it shall not lie with man, all that, yada, yada, yada. I want the right to say no to them. But I, religion is a protected class. So if Lori Smith doesn't have that right, because that would discriminate against gay people, a protected class, then I can't have that right, because that would discriminate against religion, a, a protected class. And you can't have it one way. That's the thing that these people don't understand. 
because Colorado, the Civil Rights Commission, has actually attempted to have it both ways. The same Civil Rights Commission that took Jack Phillips to court, the baker, and said, we're going to force him to bake a cake for a gay wedding, told a gay baker they did not have to do a, a homophobic uh, project for a Christian group. And obviously that's inconsistent. You can't have it both ways. And so that's not going to hold up in court either. You can't have unequal uh, enforcement of the law. So my solution, and I think this whole area is murky, but my solution is that they both have the right to deny specific custom speech-based services but nobody has the right to deny broad-based services on the basis of a characteristic. That's how I would solve it. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds like the best possible way to approach these things. And I do think I agree that as a whole, freedom of association um, should take a backseat to free speech at the end of the day. And I think that um, the, the free speech implications are just so much more vast and, and wide-ranging. So I hope that the Supreme Court comes down the right way on this case, I think I'm inclined to believe that they will, given the breakdown. But I'm curious if any of the judges have kind of tipped their hats on where they're going, or or kind of. Indicated. I think they did, uh, because, for example, uh, Amy Coney Barrett. It seems pretty clear to me, and Neil Gorsuch, that they are on the on Team Laurie Smith on this one. And Neil Gorsuch is a particularly interesting one because remember he authored a pr a huge pro gay rights discrimination law case in Bostock not too long ago. But I think it seemed to me like they, and they're going to be the swing votes here, and as well as Kavanaugh, it seemed to me that they sympathized with um, Laurie Smith in this case. We've got a clip from Justice Barrett, actually, Amy Coney Barrett, where she was pushing this same kind of hypothetical a flip around that I was just explaining. Take a listen. Mr. Fletcher, what if you have um, a gay couple who runs a web design business in a college town? And you know, a big part of their business is developing websites for student organizations, the environmental organization, like different rec club leagues, whatever. And then you have a Christian organization or Catholic organization that um, basically stands for and advocates traditional views of marriage. This is the raison d'etre for the club. They host debates, invite speakers. Um, and they want the standard website that this couple provides in their business, which is, you know, uh, graphics that make it look appealing, kind of an about us page that describes what they do and what their beliefs are. And let's say that this couple, like 303 Creative, has on the bottom of every page, like, you know, design, designed by, you know, Jack and Michael. Everything this club wants to say is an anathema to this couple. Do they have to, can you compel that speech? Do they have to publish it? I don't think they do. Why? Because I don't think that's a refusal based on status. Okay, this is my question. That's why I asked it. Because I think here there's a, a difference of opinion about whether turning down the same-sex couple simply for purposes of the marriage announcement is a turn down based on status or message. And it seems to me in my hypothetical that the status of the club is inextricably intertwined with the message they want to speak. So why is it different? So I don't know. Great minds think alike. But it sounds like ACB is uh, on the same page as me on this one. Yep, I think she is exactly on your speed. And, and she's right. And I think uh, just this simple question really kind of seems to pull at these strings and reveal, like, this is really not about anything more than pushing the LGBTQ agenda, I think. And I think that the Colorado law like has kind of been laid bare in that way where they really don't care about having a society where they're upholding everybody equally under these statutes. It really seems catered to one subset of the population at all others' expense. Um, again, it's just a really bad law that they passed. It wasn't necessary. The Civil Rights Act was functioning just fine. And like, in doing this, they really, I think, muddied the waters intentionally. And I think they're going to lose at court. I think um, it does sound like she's along your line of thinking. And just given the majority on the court right now, um, which is a good thing in this case, because I want to see free speech upheld. I, I think that we're going to see these kinds of laws get taken down. Um, but I, you know, while I want free speech to win, I, I think I kind of lament the fact that when it does in this case, as I think it will, it's going to lead to a lot of people um, feeling really bitter and feeling like 
you know, that yeah. the society, it's going to, it's going to embolden the people who actually are anti-LGBTQ, which I can't stand, like the groypers and just the, you know, gross people who come into our comments, like attacking you. And then on the left, it's going to say to them, like, see, Republicans really are all bigots. And it's like, no, we're trying, most of us, and I'm not even a Republican, but most of us on the right are trying to find ways to actually balance everybody's rights and uphold basic civil liberties. And it's hard to do in a society with 330 million diverse populations. So I, I think it's unfortunate that like that's the fallout is going to not be great either way. But that is encouraging to me that at least she is sort of poking at the real holes in their argument. And I think thinking about things, thinking about the arguments in a way that kind of reveals like the real underlying grift to it. Because this could be, you know, presented as a win for free speech for all, for Christians, for LGBT people, everything. It won't be. It will be presented as the religious right undercuts gay rights again. Far right Supreme Court deals blow to gay rights. Like, that will be the narrative. And I agree with you that is disappointing because it will cause polarization and backlash on this issue when it's not really what's happening here. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, well, I think we should get a decision soon either way. But while the Supreme Court is working to uphold the Constitution, it looks like former President Trump is trying to take it down, which is not that shocking, actually, if you've been following along. (laughs) And it's not subtle, yeah. It's not subtle, and it is right there in black and white. He took to his website, Truth Social, over the past couple days. I'm just going to read what he said. He said, so, with the revelation of massive and widespread fraud and deception. When I do that voice, it's because he's writing in all caps. In working closely with big tech companies, the DNC and the Democrat Party, do you throw the presidential election results of 2020 out and declare the rightful winner? Or do you have a new election? A massive fraud of this type and magnitude allows for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. Our great, quote, quote, founders did not want and would not condone false and fraudulent elections. So um, that got people's attention because you basically have a former president calling to overthrow the Constitution. And my first reaction was, again, one, I'm not surprised. But two, can you imagine, can you imagine the scale of the fallout if Barack Obama had written this? To overthrow the Constitution, people yeah. would have lost their ever-loving minds and they would have been right. Yeah, and they'd be right too, right? Like, you absolutely should, but like... All of the, like, and I was one of them, right? All the huffing and puffing about Obama was trying to overthrow our Constitution. And, like, eh, he kind of was, too. But, like, the fact that, like, he never came out and said it like this, right? To have a former president come out and, like, just write this so casually is where are we at in history? I would like to, like, not be in this chaos energy anymore. (laughs) And we don't have to relitigate all the fraud stuff, but we don't believe the election was stolen. Uh, There's a reason that Trump's legal team lost almost every single court case they brought. And a lot of the stuff that you hear about voting voter fraud is either isolated instances that wouldn't have affected the results, or it's been kind of debunked or misleading. And We don't have to go over all that. Election fraud does exist, but there's no evidence at all that there was enough of it to sway it in in favor of Biden. Uh, Lots of the fraudulent votes that did occur could have also been pro-Trump votes. Uh, So we don't have to relitigate all that, but it's just so crazy that he's still so obsessed with this. I've never seen a, a more of a sore loser. And he doesn't talk about any of the things he accomplished, some of which I supported. It's all just sour grapes. I'm the real winner. And then to actually say that this means we should overthrow the Constitution, the termination, to be exact, of the rules found in the Constitution. Excuse me? The, that This is why we have a Constitution. So people like you can't go rogue. And I just have to say, if you're a Republican or a conservative and you can't bring yourself to condemn this uh, because you're too afraid of what Trump's fans will think, I just don't respect that. I think that's really cowardly. I mean, you should be able to say, as if you're even a a slightly center-right person, it shouldn't take a lot for you to say, actually, I believe in the Constitution and don't want to overthrow it. That should not be a high bar, but some people are still tripping over it, and and it's just pathetic to me. I think it's absolutely absurd. I think this is tyrannical. I think he's been, I mean, I just, I feel so validated 
little me back in 2016 just getting into politics and like taking a stand against Trump because I was just like, no, this man's unhinged. And all the backlash I got for that, all the jobs I lost over that, all the like threats I had for things I said about him on social media, overwork that I had at the time, like validated, validated, validated. This man is unhinged. He was always a threat to the actual constitution, to actual civil liberties, to the actual rule of law. And while we don't need to relitigate everything, all the lies that he told after 2020, I did a full episode of the OG series of based on this called American Elections Legally Rigged. I debunked every single claim. And then I talked about the ways that our elections actually are rigged against real options and choices. So feel free to go back and check that out. It's a very in-depth episode. But if you're still falling for this, it is a lie. He has been fraudulent with this lie. He has used it to fundraise millions off the backs of people who are gullible in his fan base. And he continues to push it for one reason, and that's that I think he's hard up for cash with all of his legal <laughs> battles, and he keeps making money off of it. I mean, honestly, it's the only explanation. There is no proof to this. Like you said, they lost every round. In court. They didn't even try to allege in court the things they were saying on TV and on social media because they would have gotten laughed out of the courtroom. They had no evidence of these things. And the very few things they did think they had evidence for also got thrown out. This is ridiculous there is not widespread election fraud in this country and the fact that this guy when he lost you know came out and tried to basically have the vice president run out of the building so that he couldn't certify the election and tried to like then come in and overthrow the actual votes of millions of people is one of the most disturbing things i've ever seen and i cannot understand for the life of me how anybody is still you know, in his camp at all or like defending this because the people that I knew that that voted for Trump or supported him back in the day, like I kind of sort of got it to an extent, you know, where they were kind of like, well, I don't like him, but Hillary's worse or Biden's worse. I'm gonna hold my nose, the economy, the Supreme Court justices, etc. But like they always sort of had this idea of like, no, he really cares about America. He's trying to like restore our constitution. No, he has it right here in black and white that he wants to overthrow the constitution. And yet there is still crickets on this from people who would be losing their minds, taking to the streets if Obama or anybody on the left ever said anything close to this. Yeah, but uh, that's the thing. You said it's right there. Uh, he, he's saying, don't believe your lying eyes. Uh, the spin from the Trump supporters has been, he didn't really say overthrow the Constitution. He just said you could if there's a stolen election. Now, Trump put out a follow-up uh, tweet on Truth Social. Apparently on Truth Social, instead of tweets, they're called truths. But in this case, that name is not exactly accurate. <laughs> Trump's, Trump truthed this, this following statement. The fake news is actually trying to convince the American people that I said I wanted to terminate the Constitution. This is simply more disinformation and lies, just like Russia, Russia, Russia and all the other hoaxes and scams. What I said was that there is massive widespread fraud and deception as has been irrefutably proven in the 2020 presidential elections. Steps must be immediately taken to right the wrong. Only fools would disagree with that and accept stolen elections, MAGA. So he's literally telling you don't believe them when they say I said that thing I just sent to you in writing a day ago. I actually meant this other thing that I also said. I mean, I mean I'm not correct. buying it. Side note, the world needs your Donald Trump impersonation. Like, I think we're really missing I don't think something it's that good. Politics. I think it's, it's really good. I think it's like five out of ten. I'm buying you a wig and some orange spray paint for Christmas and we're starting a like base politics like Donald Trump impression series. We have to. <laughs> it needs to happen. <laughs> it needs to happen. But yeah, this is high key funny. Like it's 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 right there. Like do you I these boomers, like do you not know how the internet works? You wrote it on the internet. It lasts forever. We have screen grabs of it. It's in print. <laughs> like I don't understand how you can be like, nope, didn't see it. It reminds me of like when I was a kid, my brother and I had a pact because our parents were really strict, but if we ever were like on the verge of getting busted, we were just like, our pact is you deny, deny, deny. And you just keep denying. And if you just keep denying, eventually my parents would like cave because we would just be so solid in our convictions. Like one time, full on wrecked my dad's car. Full on like drove my dad's car, backed into a mailbox, knocked out the taillight. And I was like, Caleb, stand with me. We deny, deny, deny we did this. So I denied it till the cows came home. And after like two days, my dad's like, maybe I did it and just forgot. Like I gaslighted you gaslighted your dad. <laughs> I gaslit him 
into thinking he wrecked his car. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but that, I feel like that's what Trump's trying to do. He's like, didn't do it. Didn't happen. I didn't say it. Like, nope. And unfortunately, I think some people will be gaslit to thinking he didn't. So, well. Yeah. And then, well, and then some people do the whataboutism. Well, they're like, well, Democrats are trying to destroy the Constitution, too. And I'm like... First off, they don't openly say it like this, but also even if they do, that doesn't justify you becoming what you say you hate. Anyway, it just really seems to me like he's lost it and just rambling uh, out into the ether at this point. I hope people wake up. Yeah, well, he can keep howling at the moon. We've got to move on to our next roundup, which is our very online roundup. And it's not going to get any saner, guys, but we promise it will stay entertaining. Let's check in on Kanye West. I can't even say oh. it with a straight face. I can't even, like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Folks will remember that Ye, how he goes now, went off the deep end last week doing interviews with Alex Jones where he said he likes Hitler. I mean, yeah. not making this well, up. He, so he likes we, Hitler. We covered last week on the podcast, because we record on Tuesdays, we release on Wednesdays. We covered his meltdown on the Tim Pool show where he walked out. The yes. very next day, as our podcast is going live, he goes on Alex Jones. And if you missed it, I am jealous of you, because it was the most unhinged rant I've ever seen. He goes on this, like, weird black Balenciaga, like, blackout, like, BDM mask, and basically says he loves Hitler, and that Hitler had, you know, That's good a direct quote. And, yeah. No, I'm not being hyperbolic here. He literally said he liked Hitler. Like, literally. And Alex Jones was like, who's usually the craziest, like, guy in the room, was like, oh, are you sure about that? And Trump's like, oh, sorry. And Kanye's like, yeah, love him. Like, he's great. So, yeah, it got even weirder. Um, it's continued to stay weird. Like, I just... And I want to be serious. Like, we are kind of making fun of him on this show. And, like, I don't know what else to do in this situation, but it is having real life implications. I live in a heavily Jewish neighborhood in Atlanta. My Kroger is literally called the Kosher Kroger because there are so many Jewish people that here that we have a huge like kosher section. Um, there's tons of like synagogues and temples around me, Jewish schools, um, clubs, activities. And I have a lot of friends who are Jewish who also live in this neighborhood. And they have been telling me that like the actual threats to their places of worship, to their schools have been increasing. They are keeping them on high alert. Like they're sending out community like alert systems to them. They're keeping like police lights on at their churches throughout the night so that people don't try to like burn them down or like graffiti them. So, you know, you can't blame all of this on Kanye, but I do think when you have this kind of global figure coming out on the platforms he's coming out on and saying the things he's saying, it riles up the seedy underbelly. And I do think it like, it pours gasoline on the situation and it's very scary for people who are Jewish right now. It's very scary for people who love Jewish people right now. And I think it's just a very actually sad moment in our history. Um, but I think my hope is that in laughing Kanye out of the room for being the absurd, ridiculous person that he is, um, is a message to other people that think like him that like you won't be accepted in society if you think like this you won't be you know it's not going to be something that just goes away and people forget about or they like kind of secretly agree with you we don't secretly agree with you we think you're unhinged and crazy and you need to get it together and like fix your lives and quit being racist period like yeah, blame like, other people for your problems by letting him spew this insanity uh, we're basically like they're saying oh this is why free speech is bad no this is kind of why free speech works because the more he spews the more he lights his own credibility and career on fire and i agree it is very unfortunate for jewish people that this is happening in public but i think in the long run if he had stayed more subtle or not done interviews people would have maybe been more veiled in his anti-semitism Maybe he would have ultimately been more influential, but now that he's just gone full crazy, people are seeing him for what he is, and that's continuing. So in his latest interview, Ye uh, tells Jewish people that they should forgive Hitler. Take a look at this. You can't tell me who I can love and who I can't love. You can't say, you can't force your pain on everyone else. Jewish people, forgive Hitler today. Let it go. Let it go and stop trying to force it on other people. Good night. So I have questions. Firstly, because last week he was saying the Holocaust didn't happen. Now he's saying Jewish people should forgive them. I guess it's not surprising that Ye, that Ye is inconsistent at the moment. But what an absurd thing to say, huh? 
I this is what makes me so annoyed by this is that even on my own Facebook, which I increasingly just think my Facebook commenters are getting real fringe and weird. Like, sorry, guys, <laughs> but like some something weird's going on on Facebook. <laughs> um, but like, there will literally still be people who are like, well, what context did he say it in? Or like, well, like, did he really say that? Did he really say that quote about Hitler? And I'm like, yes, shouldn't we forgive yes. everyone? Like, yeah. <laughs> he's just preaching a message of love and like forgiveness. It's like all the way off. <laughs> F all the way off. Like, we see you. You're just as bad. Like, please go away. Like, there is no excusing this. And I just, this kind of clip is so bonkers. First and foremost, there are many thousands of incredible examples of Jewish people forgiving their oppressors and people who murdered their families and the guards. Like, I, throughout Christian literature, have read so many examples of that, including from Corey Ten Boom, who is a famous figure from the Holocaust who uh, survived the concentration camps, but who lost her entire family to these mass murderers and then became a witness when she left this camp, wrote many books and shared her experience and actually like openly forgave um, in person some people that she met who asked for forgiveness down the road. So I just, it's, it's so demeaning to the experience of what the Jewish community endured during that, but also such a ridiculously ignorant statement about their um, incredible forgiveness that they have shown throughout history of the persecution they have experienced in from multiple generations and and in multiple countries um so i just think he is such a total just hot airbag like i cannot even fathom the shallowness and like lack of seriousness embodied in a person that he is it is just a ridiculous statement and he needs serious help and i'm just i don't but again, like, I'm kind of less worried about Kanye at this point. I'm like, he can go off and be crazy and do whatever he wants. I'm more concerned about the people who are still, like, simping for him um, and excusing away this kind of language. And I, I don't get it. I think it's just bizarre and creepy and weird. I agree completely. And I don't understand why so many people are still defending him. I mean, he's literally said he likes Hitler and is questioning with the Holocaust and also telling Jews, get over it. I mean, it's just wildly unhinged it's offensive it's bizarre um i don't know i at at the beginning of all this i still felt bad for him um but you know mental illness is not an excuse there's lots of mentally ill people whose manic depressive episodes don't involve insane jew hatred now i under like i understand that like a lot of people's mania is not going to be politically correct and i it's complicated But it's not as simple as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Oh, well, he's mentally unwell. Well, what about all the people who are defending him or propping him up or exploiting him? Um, They are not necessarily have the same get-out-of-jail-free card. And even him, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. You still have some culpability here for the harm that you're doing. Um, But I just hope that people... Stop platforming him. And I know we're talking about it, but look, the, the interviews that he's doing are getting so many tens of, and tens of millions of views that any light we cast on them is just infinitesimally small by comparison. So, um, And it's what people are talking about. So I do think we have to keep up with it. But hopefully he shuts up and goes away sometime soon. Yeah, and as a mental health advocate, you know, this is something I've been working on since before I was even in politics full time. I care deeply about issues around mental health. Having mental illness is not an excuse for for being a racist. It's not an excuse for any bad behavior. You have a responsibility as an individual to work on yourself, to heal yourself, to take care of your illness, especially if you have a severe illness. You have responsibility to take your medicine, to be healthy, to work out, to, to actively work to ensure that you are not cutting and bleeding on other people because you were wounded. And I think that that is just such an actual illness in our society where people want to use not only mental illnesses, but like trauma or anything bad that happens to them as an excuse to be bad people and it's like no you don't get an out for that i have sympathy for you i struggle with an anxiety disorder that i have to live with every day that does not give me an excuse to be a bad person or to let that impact other people or harm other people so um there's and also i think when you do that it stigmatizes mental illness right there is nothing inherent about a bipolar diagnosis that makes you a racist or an anti-semite and he doesn't get a pass for that at all so okay let's move on to the next clip what do we have on deck So we're going to talk about an issue near and dear to my heart as somebody who's constantly afflicted by this serious woe. Pretty privilege. A woman recently went viral on TikTok for complaining about just how hard life can be as a beautiful person. I found a lot to relate to in this video. Uh, Take a listen to this one, guys. 
I'm fully prepared for TikTok to hate me. I can see it now. Y'all are going to be like, oh, F you. Being pretty is so hard. Hear me out. Pretty privilege is a thing. I'm not here to deny that. So too, it comes with disadvantages. I've never once been in a job where I haven't been harassed. I've rarely been in social situations where I haven't been harassed. People do not usually take no for an answer with me because they think that I'm something to be possessed. People do not ask before touching me in public. I am grabbed regularly. I've been assaulted by a stranger. And I was once passed up on for a business opportunity because they said that I was too young and beautiful and they thought that that would be distracting to the other people in the industry. True story. I am treated differently and it is night and day from when I go out in public in a mask in raggedy oversized clothes and looking like I am right now. When I look raggedy, people don't touch me. They don't feel entitled to me. So not always a privilege. I'm so Hannah, what can I say? It's just really hard to be beautiful. I mean, I know this is something that you struggle with regularly, Brad. You and I talk about <laughs> it pretty frequently, and it's it's a real hindrance in your life. So I, I'm glad that you are finding a community of solidarity to share this experience with, and I'm glad that you're going to use this platform to, to talk about the barriers that you face as a pretty person. No, I actually, like, I wanted to hate this clip, and then I didn't hate it. Um, I thought she had some good points, but I don't know. I think the concept of pretty privilege is really interesting because... I certainly think it exists, um, and I think that it's um, it's we've researched it, right? Like it's it's not even something that's like mentally like people are choosing to do. There are actual biological like evolutionary reasons. Your brain is more likely to trust people who are attractive. You are more likely to like go into business with them, to be nice to them, to hold doors open for them. On and on it goes. Um, and then you also have the societal things where, you know, we're more likely to think people who are pretty are smarter um, or are people that, you know, have higher ethics, whatever the case. And we're more inclined to think people who are overweight or who have, you know, some kind of, um, or who are just not put together, or, like don't bring as much to the table or aren't as smart or like somehow don't deserve as much in life. And so I don't mind us talking about pretty privilege because I think it's it's always good to be self-aware of how little control you have over your brain, which is a fascinating subject to me. I used to be a big believer in the concept of free will. I don't really believe it anymore. I think our brains are running off without us and we don't even know it half the time. So I love talking about this. And I will say like, I experienced the opposite a few years ago. So when I was in my late 20s, I was still working like in nonprofit organizing and like didn't have my money up. And I was, you know, just starting to age a little bit and had gained a little weight. And I remember the exact moment I was walking through the Detroit airport, I was traveling for work and it hit me like, oh my God, I'm losing my looks. And it wasn't because anybody did anything to me. Like no one was mean to me, nobody said anything, nothing happened. It was the absence all of a sudden that I noticed throughout the day of people not going above and beyond for me. Like no one had offered to like carry my bag to the front desk. No one had been like, giving me a free drink at the airport bar, like just little things like that, that I was so accustomed to getting that all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, nobody's doing these things for me. Like I'm losing my looks. Oh my God. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like how terrifying it would be all of a sudden to be old. Right. Because you know, especially as a woman, like society continues to devalue you as you age. And I was like, I just all of a sudden got hit with like my own mortality and was like, Oh my God, what's it going to be like when I'm like 70 years old? Is everyone just going to ignore me? And it's like, the sad truth is we kind of do as a society. Like we certainly stop like treating people the same. So I will say, I think pretty privilege is a real thing. The examples she brings up, I think are accurate. I do think, especially for women, like the amount of times people just touch you in public when you don't want to be touched, the sexual harassment at work, even like I think often for me, especially being in the two career paths that I chose, which were pr pretty heavily male dominated, both music and politics, there was a lot of times I felt like I wasn't taken seriously or given the credibility I should have been in my profession because I was a young woman who was like attractive and people just assumed I wasn't as smart or people have often assumed like, oh, you just got your career because you're pretty or because like your daddy helped you or things like that. So. There are some downsides, but I don't think the downsides to being pretty in any way outweigh the immense privileges and like upside to it. Yeah, I think the idea of privilege in being good looking is obviously kind of true. I mean, it's like documented that people just even even it's not a sexual thing because even like a man who's heterosexual statistically has been shown to just like uh, or be more, be more open to a man who is good looking in terms of friendship business anything there's a there's a bias there just human bias 
but I don't think that's entirely beyond our control because some of it's natural looks, but some of it's also presentation and how well you keep yourself up. Are you fit? Are you well put together? Uh, and then this idea, obviously for everything, there's privileges to it and there's downsides to it. The downsides she lists, I think are a little far-fetched to some of them. Like to say, I've always been harassed or anything. I think that happens to women who aren't traditionally pretty almost yeah. just as much because a lot of predatory behavior is not actually rooted in like sex as much as it is like power and crossing lines and things. So I don't know that that's actually relevant to being pretty or not being pretty. Uh, and so are, I, I do believe there are some downsides. Like, for example, the pretty girl in school never gets asked out because all the boys are too intimidated. Like, or other girls sometimes don't want to be friends with girls who are really gorgeous. Yeah. I, like, there's valid downsides here. But I thought she was maybe uh, overselling them a little bit. And I agree with you. The downsides definitely don't outweigh uh, the upsides um, because I certainly wouldn't change my gorgeous good looks <laughs> if I had the opportunity. No, I'm kidding. But no, you're oh, you and I have said this man. before. To do what we do, to be in on TV, to be uh, in, influencers, cringe word, but whatever, in social media, you have to be at least a seven. <laughs> yeah. Well, you also have to, like, be very confident in your looks. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, and I know this, like, nothing gets under the skin of my haters faster than the fact that I like how I look. Like, it drives them insane. But, like, I don't, I really don't care. There's nothing somebody could say to me online that would make me be like, oh, I'm ugly, I guess. Or, like, I'm undecided. Yeah, no, like, people I know insult I'm my not, looks. So. They'll be like, your ears, your eyes, blah, blah, blah. And I just don't care because, like, I know I'm a, a, a decent enough looking guy. And I also know that's not really my main value add anyway. Yeah. So. It just doesn't really get to me. And it's always, it's, oh, it's never a hot person insulting your looks online. It's always an uggo because they're projecting <laughs> their own insecurities. Yeah, because it's like their biggest fear is to not be found attractive. And they're just projecting on you. And I'm like, I, first and foremost, don't care if you find me attractive, like, whatsoever. I'd actually prefer if you don't and leave me alone. But secondarily, like, it's never been a problem in my life not being able to get any man I wanted, not being able to, like, <laughs> get the positions in society I want. Like, I'm good. So, Keep your hate, don't care, keep it moving. But yeah, I don't know. I think this is an interesting concept. And again, I think it's really important for us to be mindful of how we treat people and mindful of our own subjective biases. So hopefully we can work to overcome them and treat everybody equally well and get rid of our brain's ridiculous stereotyping mechanisms. All right, on to the mailbag. What do we have on deck this week? So Allison wrote, I love how you guys are unabashedly Gen Z, but still libertarians. As an elder millennial, I do sometimes have to Google your terms. For example, <laughs> sus. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me informed on politics and what the kids are saying these days. Laugh emoji. Yeah, I think I think that's funny. Hannah's technically a millennial. I'm technically Gen Z. So we give you the best of both worlds from the yeah. younger perspective. I just have a lot of Botox, and I also have a young colleague and a young brother. So people think I'm Gen Z all the time, which is fantastic. <laughs> okay, Better than James, the opposite. It's better than people thinking you're like a Gen Xer. <laughs> I know, right? Like, that'd be, that'd be bad. All right. James said, if Brad is being so dishonest about Trump, what else is he being dishonest about? I had high hopes for him. Oh, yeah. sir, oh, please well. put down the Kool-Aid. Put the Kool-Aid down. All right, King of Troy said, is Brad a low-T beta? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know uh, what This that is probably means. From, the, from the alpha males who didn't like us criticizing the anti-feminist person. Uh, oh, yeah. It's funny, a lot of the comments alpha were like, uh, th they were like, this dude doesn't get any girls, I'm sure, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just like, okay. I think people who need to who go around the world needing to boast about how high T is in testosterone, uh, they are, are are strange. In the same way, if you go around the world thinking I'm I'm like needing to pronounce to everyone how alpha you are, that's not a very alpha thing to do. I'm gonna be so, really clear. Yeah. Any man in the comments making comments like this is one, not an alpha, two, not getting laid, and three, <laughs> to never comment on like gender romance dynamics ever again. Like nobody wants these little boys in the comment sections trolling people. Like, please fix yourself. So so Donda wrote, You guys are very low vibration. What the f what, what does that mean? <laughs> you guys don't get it. Stop bashing yay if you don't understand what he is trying to say. 
So God. this is funny to me because they commented on this before the Alex Jones interview where he literally said, quote, I like Hitler. Um, and so they're saying this was when he was just, you know, saying the Jews control the media, blah, blah, blah. And, and these people were saying he's misunderstood. You guys don't get it. And then like a day later, he literally said, I like Hitler. So your comment did not age well, Donda. Donda is also Kanye West's mom's name. So this is like a super sent fan commenting this first and foremost. Oh. But, but also like that was my Twitter um, post when his Alex Jones interview came out. I was like all the like yay simps still standing there. I'd be like, what do you think he meant by anti-Semitism? Uh, he's not anti-Semitic. And then tr- he's like, actually, I like Hitler. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, okay. Thanks for at we- least the clarity. He at least gave us clarity. Yeah. All right, Skywalker40 said, Brad, when you said bruh to Hannah's crystal, I nearly spit my coffee on my monitor because it came out of nowhere. Your hot take was a little overgeneralized given you don't like sweet potatoes. Sorry, not sorry. Great job, folks. I will say your reaction to my crystal was the funniest thing I saw all week. Like, And I think it's funny because it's so not me. Like, It is out of left field entirely, but I still like my crystal. I've been carrying it around. It's awesome. It's a nice it's, little... You're just usually logical, and the crystal thing is so irrational. It makes no sense. I'm just telling you you it feels nice in the palm of my hand it keeps me calm and i'm gonna keep it all right well it's a free country so (laughs) this was another one in the same vein dh wrote kanye just wanted the subject open and talked about by the masses mission accomplished yeah no he's just misunderstood he's just asking questions (laughs) he just wants this talked about two days later i like hitler (laughs) also he just wants this talked about by the masses like our jews and a secret cartel controlling everything and like these evil terrible people he just wants us to ask questions and talk about it it's casual it's not anti-semitic he just wants everybody to talk about that and maybe persecute the jews okay like i just i don't understand like how deep in the simp well do you have to be to still be out here defending kanye west like his ex-wife Very bounced deep. his kids bounce you can get off the train it's okay <laughs> let it go all right, let's move on to our hot takes. Um, I'm beginning to Christmas shop, and I have a confession. I do not know how to wrap, wrap presents. I mean, I like, technically know how, but I can't do it. I'm so bad at it. I, it looks like a five-year-old wrapped up a bomb for people when I do my own gift wrapping. It's embarrassing. And I also just, I really don't, It's I hate it, but also it's like, it's so much trash just to throw away. I think gift wrapping should be abolished and we should move on to better ways of presenting gifts. I like gift bags. Gift bags are nice. They can be reused. They're very easy. They look pretty and festive. I also just, I don't know, I kind of like just like giving somebody a gift. Like, especially if it's my family. I'm like, can I just give it to you? Like, do I really need to wrap it? Especially because usually at this age, like your family's telling you what they want. You're buying them what they want. Like, there's no surprise. Why are we wrapping things? I don't understand. That's my hot take. Yeah, I like gift bags because I can't wrap things nice, so they always look like a two-year-old wrapped it. And then also they could be reused, so it's just not wasteful. Mm -hmm. Um, So my hot take is that I think New Year's is a stupid holiday. Um, And I think the entire, like, celebrating the New Year is just, it's so arbitrary. It's like the, the years are insignificant. Nothing has actually changed between... The last day of December in a year, and then the ne- the next day, January first. That it's just somebody made up these arbitrary calendars, and then said this day from now on is September first or whatever. Like it's just totally arbitrary. It's made up. New Year's resolutions are stupid. Uh, new Year, new me. Like it's going to be so annoying in my workout classes that I go to a couple times a week <laughs> when all of a sudden they're packed and I can't get six square inches of space to do my Pilates because there's all these people in here for two weeks before they give up. And I just think if you're not willing to like set a goal and dedicate yourself to it any other day of the year, New Year's is not going to provide you with some magical special uh, energy to do it. I just stop. You have to find it from within, not use some meaningless arbitrary uh quirk of the calendar yeah i think you're right about that especially about you know just finding like motivation like i don't think you should wait to start something you really want to do but i do love a fresh start like i love mondays i stand by that i love mondays they're one of my favorite days of the week i love just like getting after it on a monday and i kind of feel the same way about new year's it's like it's a good restart it's just like a refreshing thing and i will say this 
I, I firmly believe some years are good and some years are bad. And yes, they're arbitrarily like defined, but I explain it better to me than that. Like some years I'm just like, that this was a more garbage crystal. year. This is more it, crystals logic. No, I started thinking the energy in 2021 was no good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the energy though. It's just like when I was six, I had one of the worst years of my life. And then when I turned seven, I had one of the best years of my life and I'll never forget it. And like, I've noticed that in other years as well, like 2012 garbage year, hated it. 2020, one of the best years of my life. Like, I don't know. There just are, like, some years are on. Like, honestly, this year has been a little off for me. It's had a lot of drama, like, behind the scenes. There's been a lot of work getting the company off the ground. Like, I'm ready for a fresh start. I'm looking forward to a new year and, like, hitting refresh. Also, Old Lang Syne, arguably one of the best holiday songs of all time. And I love a champagne toast, which I know you don't love. But I like the bubble. I actually like the taste of champagne. Do you? Do you a little champagne taste? Yeah. You know what I've started drinking? I've started drinking... um, like club soda mixed with cranberry as like a substitute cocktail. It's very good. Oh my gosh. Do you know what I found? This is kind of amazing. What? I mean, you don't care because you never drink, but for people who used to drink and quit, um, I'm having a holiday party this weekend. I have some friends who are sober. I found online like alcoholless bourbon and alcoholless wine. I literally ordered it. It was like $30 and it comes in like, it looks Ooh. like bourbon. It's, it tastes like bourbon. And I was like, what an amazing innovation for people who are, like, really trying to quit but just, like, miss the taste, miss – or, like, just want something in your hand to hold at a party, you know, to, like, not feel like you're odd man out. I thought that was so cool, so I'm really excited to serve that. All right, guys, that's a wrap. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Until next week, stay based.